Hello everyone and welcome to the Speculative Wildlife Research Center, where we reimagine creatures and monsters from all realms of fiction through the lens of speculative biology, the genre of science fiction that applies scientific principles and knowledge about biology, ecology and evolution to creature design and world building. Today we will be looking at trolls, the famous beings from European myth and legend and imagine what such creatures would be like as living, breathing animals. While trolls, as many legendary beings, are somewhat closer to nature spirits than to actual living beings, often showing many mystical and unearthly properties, I thought it would be fun to try to recontextualize these creatures as real animals. Not as, say, a replacement, but as an earthly counterpart to the more legendary trolls. So, without further ado, let's get started. Trolls, scientific name Daimopithecus borealis, first reached Europe after migrating from the jungles of Central Africa, home of the biggest still-living apes. It seems, before leaving their home, the ancestors of trolls found an advantageous niche as omnivores, which allowed them to diversify their food sources and, with them, the reach of their habitat. Troll ancestors soon found themselves straying further and further from the jungles in search of both new vegetable sources of food and new living prey. This new hunting and roaming lifestyle allowed for a new adaptation that closely mirrored our own evolution, bipedalism. The feet became narrower and the legs became stronger, allowing the trolls to walk on two feet rather than relying on their knuckles for support. This meant the hands were free to be used for hunting and rudimentary tool use, which mainly involved smashing things with rocks. Upon leaving their original habitat, the ancestors of trolls almost immediately lost their fur in order to help them with thermoregulation in the hotter and less densely vegetated plains of northern Africa. However, this would not be the final destination of these large apes. Constantly migrating north, the first trolls finally found themselves in the colder regions of northern Europe, where their coat of fur was partially regrown in order to help them accommodate to this new climate. Along with this, they also developed a thicker layer of body fat that helped insulate them against the cold, as well as a greatly expanded inner nasal cavity, which heats the cold air as the troll breathes in. While still capable of feeding on plant matter, the constantly changing vegetation as they migrated meant trolls had become almost exclusively carnivores by this point. Taking on a nocturnal large predator niche, which drove their populations away from their own, trolls soon thrived on these new lands. Helped by their senses of smell and hearing, vastly improved from those of their jungle ancestors, trolls stalk prey from the shadows and position themselves for a surprise attack. They launch themselves to their prey with a burst of speed and either tear their prey apart using feet and nails, same as other primate species, or take the injured prey back to their nest for future consumption. While the muscles anchored to the sagittal crest have somewhat weakened due to the troll switching to a softer diet than that of their ancestors, their jaws are still strong enough to break the bones of the prey and access the nutritious marrow inside. While powerful hunters, trolls are poorly equipped for a prolonged chase. Should the first surprise attack fail, the chances of a successful hunt lower dramatically, as trolls tire quickly and will run out of breath should they try to outrun prey by foot. Trolls are social organisms and tend to form big bands led by the biggest male a king of sorts, who is entrusted with protecting the others. While not retaining exclusive reproductive rights, 
which is made often impossible due to the sheer size of the band they lead, troll kings will receive better attention than both males or females of a lower hierarchy, mostly expressed through food tributes and grooming sessions, which makes the position of the king a rather enviable one. Other males, both from within and without the group, will occasionally challenge the king for dominion of the territory, throwing heavy boulders in order to display their strength. If these displays are not enough to intimidate the king, and the king's own display does not deter the challenger, then challenges are bound to turn violent. When this happens, both combatants will resort to throwing boulders at each other before tearing at the opponent with their fangs and nails. Because of this, the life of kings tends to be a very short one, as the constant challenges wear down one's powerful males. Even the mightiest of kings will be replaced in a couple of years by younger, stronger males. When searching for places to rest, trolls usually prefer well-sheltered areas, such as caves and tunnels. These types of shelters protect sleeping trolls from attacks by potential predators or competitors, and may be turned into long-term homes for future generations. However, larger groups, which may count with large enough numbers to deter or fight off competitors, are known to make their homes and breeding grounds outdoors, using the area's vegetation to build nests, beds, and even rudimentary huts. Trolls will often be accepted into the territory of a king without much trouble, where they will form their own short-term couples during the mating season. This, however, is not the only way trolls organize. Smaller, familiar groups are also common, and younger adult males will often group together and form nomadic troops that fall outside the territory and protection of big groups. These roving groups of males will often engage in large-scale invasions of other territories, aggressively mauling its inhabitants in an attempt to drive them away, sometimes even catastrophically invading human settlements. Juvenile trolls become independent quite early in their lives, and often join together in small bands. While not completely separated from the adults, Juvenile trolls will roam, explore, and hunt together without any supervision or parental care. Trolls will often take mud baths before sleeping, allowing the mud to dry and only removing it from their bodies after awakening. The mud that cakes the trolls' sensitive skin protects them from the sunlight, but also rids them from the parasites that live in their skin and fur. This behavior is particularly important for trolls that live by themselves or are low in the group's hierarchy, as these are not as likely to be groomed by others. Funnily enough, the appearance of these trolls sleeping after having taken a mud bath has given rise to the belief that they turn to stone during the day. As can be imagined, the relationship between trolls and humans has been rather tense. Ever since human and troll populations have shared a habitat, confrontations have been unavoidable. Being a large enough predator, trolls target human prey very often, and in turn have been hunted back by humans in order to prevent further loss of human lives. Fascinatingly, trolls seem to understand a certain kinship between humans and themselves, despite also considering us as food. Trolls have been observed throwing boulders at either people or their settlements, just as they do when challenging kings. Whether this means they understand us to be similar to them, or only consider us to be a special type of competition, it remains to be known. Truth be told, Stories of people that manage to escape being attacked by trolls by exploiting this behavior are not exactly uncommon. They are, after all, 
extremely aggressive whenever they feel threatened or challenged. While it's almost impossible for a human being to best them in strength, even children have been told to survive being attacked by trolls by either challenging them or exploiting their natural aggressiveness, managing to take their focus off the hunt and allowing the victim to escape. As human populations grew and further developed their building techniques, trolls started camping on their bridges and inside barns, and have even attacked entire towns to use them as shelter. Even juvenile trolls have been known to cause trouble, as they tend to roam human settlements, even breaking into homes and barns in order to satisfy their curiosities. While not actively harmful, the amount of damages they cause can be extensive. The troll's sharp sense of hearing while an important tool in catching prey, has also proven to be a problem for their species, further aggravating their relationship with humans. Human presence, after all, has forced them to endure amounts of noise far above anything present in the natural world. One of the best early examples of this is the tolling of church bells, loud enough to drive entire populations of trolls away. Bands of trolls have been known to attack the grounds where a church is being built, having learned to identify the source of such noise and attempting to stop it from hurting them. Nowadays, high levels of urbanization and the noise resulting from technological advancements and growing human populations are enough to keep trolls far away from human population centers. In modern times, it is rare that a human being ever gets to see a troll in its natural habitat. And that's it for a speculative biology look into trolls. I hope you all enjoyed this video. Like I said, there are lots of things about trolls that don't exactly make sense from a biological standpoint nor are they supposed to, as stories about trolls are not meant to be about literal flesh and bone beings, but often incorporate elements of nature spirits and embodying the fears of people at the time. That said, it was a lot of fun to imagine this alternate evolutionary path for a creature so close, in more than one way, to human beings, and I hope you also liked how this turned out. Thank you all for watching and see you next time on the Speculative Wildlife Research Center.